Hi, I'm Chris, and in this tutorial, we're going to be creating a 2D adventure game using Adventure Creator. Now, this is actually a remake of an earlier tutorial I made. It's not fundamentally going to be any different. The ending result is going to be pretty much the same, but that tutorial was made in Unity 4 and quite an old version of AC now. And so while things haven't changed too much, this is aimed as an absolute beginner's crash course in using Adventure Creator, and it also takes into account users new to Unity as well. So I think it's important to be as up-to-date as it can be. If you're looking to make a 3D game instead of a 2D one, it's still worth going through this if you're new to Unity and AC. Adventure Creator is available from Unity's Asset Store, and I'm using Unity 2017.1 and I'll be importing the latest release, which is Adventure Creator 1.60.3. Now, when you import Adventure Creator, you are able to import two demo games that come with the package. These are in the 2D demo and demo folders. We're going to be using assets from the 2D demo, but we're not going to be doing anything with the 3D demo. This is the 3D demo game. I'm just going to uncheck that so that it's not imported, just to make the uh, the installation time a little bit less and keep the file sizes down. And once it's finished compiling the scripts, it's then going to give us this installation box that tells us that it wants to make a couple of changes. It wants to add a new input and a couple of layers. It can do it all automatically, but it just wants to confirm that this is OK. So I'll just press OK and it will carry on importing. Once it's finished importing, it then tells you in the console that it's created the layers and the input. And we can test out the 2D demo game by going up to the top and choosing Adventure Creator, Getting Started, and then Load 2D Demo. As well as opening up the 2D demo scene, it will also open the AC Game Editor window, which is what we're going to be working with most of the time. So I'll dock this into this vertical space here, and I'll just mute the audio, and the 2D demo then begins. So having loaded the 2D demo up, you can see here in the game editor, we've got references to a 2D demo asset file. And this asset file is a manager file. And we have eight tabs up here, scene, settings, actions, and so on and all of them reference this 2D demo asset file. So each of these tabs represents a manager, which is an aspect of your game. So the 2D demo, as does any AC game, has eight manager asset files, one for each tab. And so when creating a new game, you need to have your own set of manager files. So let's go and create that now. I'll do this from a new scene, and then up to the top, I'll choose Adventure Creator, Getting Started, and New Game Wizard. I can choose Next, and enter in a game name. I'm going to be very creative, and type in My 2D Game. Choose Next. We then select a camera perspective. This is going to be a 2D game. Our interface setting. Uh, this is covered in the manual, but essentially context sensitive means we only have one type of interaction for each hotspot. We can only use a hotspot in one way, whereas the other two here mean that we can assign multiple interactions for a hotspot. I think for variety, uh, in contrast with the other tutorials, I'm going to choose choose interaction then hotspot. But None of this is set in stone. You can change all of these settings later on. Next again, our GUI system. I'll leave this as default AC because it's the fastest to get up and running with. We can then confirm all of our choices and click Finish. It'll then ask us if we want to set the scene up so we can quickly begin working. Just to demonstrate, I'll choose Yes and then close this, and you can see we have a whole bunch of game objects in our hierarchy 
These are mainly just folder objects, um, just for convenience. And over by the game editor, you can see we now have our My 2D Game set of managers assigned in each tab. Now it's worth mentioning that when you update Adventure Creator, or you want to switch to, say, a demo game to see what it looks like, you do need to reassign your managers, um, which you can do by just choosing the asset file that's loaded. But if you have a look in the project window, you'll see we've now got a, a subfolder of the same name as the game name we entered. We have a managers subfolder where all of these assets are. But in this root folder, we have a manager package file. And if we double click on that, all of these asset files are assigned automatically. Now to demonstrate what happened here, I'll go to a new scene. And you can see we have the scene manager disappears. And that's because we need to organize our room objects. And we can do it with folders, as in with those, um, those empty game objects, or without them, it's, it's really your choice. If I choose without folders, we'll just get the bare minimum objects needed. Or I can choose with folders to bring up all of these, um, these helper objects. Incidentally, if the AC game editor is not showing for you, or if you've closed it, you can bring it back up easily by going to Adventure Creator, Editors, Game Editor. So let's start building our scene. I'll open up the scene window and check 2D mode. I think I'll get rid of this light here because we're just going to be using shadeless sprites. And let's put down some background scenery. So as I was saying, we're going to be using the 2D demos assets, which we can find in Adventure Creator, 2D Demo, Graphics, Sprites, and then Park. And I'll drag in Park Ground, let's see, um, Park Sky, Park Background, and Park Tree. Now you can see some of these are um, being placed behind the sky. It's not in the right order. So let's correct that. If I select any of these sprites and view their inspector, you can see that we have an order in layer value, and the lower the number, the further it appears from the camera. So we'll make the park sky the, um, the bottom one. So I'll set the order in layer to minus 10. The park background, I'll set to minus 5. The ground will leave at 0, and park tree I'll set to 5. Zoom in a little bit, and I'll place the tree down. Now, we could do it as um, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, but it helps to separate by a few numbers because we're going to be adding in characters later on, and characters will be placed in between these numbers. You can also see in our scene we have this blue arrow here, and that is our player start, or more specifically, our default player start, as it's listed in the scene manager. Actually, before I talk any more about that, I'm just going to do one bit of housekeeping, select all of these sprites and place in this set geometry folder um, so we can collapse and remove from view. So going back to this player start, this is where the player will begin if we begin the game from this scene. And I can position and rotate it so that we can set where the player uh, is going to be standing and facing. We're going to be making a player shortly, but before we do that, let's create the nav mesh so that he can walk around. The nav mesh, or the default nav mesh, is listed just above the default player start field here in our scene manager, and none is created at the moment, and that means that we can click on this create button so that's created our default nav mesh object inside our navigation hierarchy folders. It's a bit hard to see. Uh, it's got this white pentagon shape, um, but this is essentially a polygon collider 2D component, if you're familiar with Unity already. And we can bring it down 
and I'm going to uh, have it cover the the ground here. So this is basically where the player will be able to walk. And that's because we're going to be making a point and click game. So as we click around the scene, the player is only going to be able to walk around this space. And by the way, I can change the shape by clicking on this Edit Collider button here. Now you'll also see that we've got this tree in the middle of the scene. And we need to be able to um, have a, another shape that defines this tree stump here so that the player doesn't go through it. We're going to do that using another object. So I'll choose Game Object, Create Empty. I'll put it in the same NavMesh hierarchy folder. And I'll add component, typing in Polygon Collider 2D. I'll check is trigger because this is only going to be used for navigation and nothing to do with collision. And again, we can edit the points for this. And I'll shape them around roughly around the, the base of the tree, like so. I'll click this again to stop editing the shape and I'll rename this object uh, tree base. We now just need to register this as a whole within our main nav mesh, which we can do by going to the default nav mesh object. And in the navigation mesh inspector, I'm going to set the number of holes from zero to one. We now get a hole field, which takes a polygon collider 2D. So I'm going to drag the tree base into that field. And we can demonstrate its effect by running the game. And if I then look at the scene window, you can see that um, the hole has basically kind of been merged with the main nav mesh. So it's probably a bit hard to see in the video, but if you start moving around your default nav mesh, you can see that it all moves as one object. Before we go any further, I'm just going to correct the camera. If we open up the uh, the game window while we're not running, you can see that the um, the camera's really zoomed out. So I'm just going to correct that by going to the main camera and reduce the field of view and lower the position as well. Now we're actually going to be um, making a proper camera, but this will just tide us over in the meantime. So we can find the graphics for our player inside Adventure Creator, 2D Demo, Graphics, Sprites, and then Brain. And he has different subfolders for each of his different animations. I'm going to drag in idle underscore D, although it doesn't technically matter which one we use because we're going to be overriding it with animation. So we have a, a downward facing idle sprite here, which I'll rename uh, player sprite. And to convert him into a character, we're going to use the character wizard. So up at the top, we'll choose adventure creator, character wizard. And then this behaves much, uh, much like the new game wizard in that we just follow through different pages, filling in fields as we go. So is this a player or an NPC? This is going to be a player. We then assign a base graphic, and that's this player sprite here. Now, it doesn't work if we're using prefabs or asset files, so we have to use a game object that is in our scene. Choosing next again, how should this player uh, be animated? Sprites Unity is the, uh, the most simple method of animating 2D characters, so we'll choose that and then finish. Now our player has been placed back at the origin and you can see, if I move them out of the way, uh, we've actually got our player sprite as a child object now of this new root object here. And it's at this root object that has our player component 
that we can use to configure everything. But before anything else, I'm going to make him a prefab, which I can do by dragging his game object into my My2D game folder. You can also have AC recognize him as our main player by going up to the game editor, choosing the settings manager, which is where all of our game wide settings are. And underneath character settings, we have a field for our player. So I'll drag him in there. And then even if we disable or remove the player object from our scene, he'll be spawned in automatically uh, from this settings manager field. So let's take a look at what we have so far. The player is being displayed underneath the ground. So I think actually I'll change the set geometry uh, park ground. I'll change the ordering layer to minus one instead. Because um, if I just re-enable him, our player sprite also has an ordering layer of zero. So he's now um, on top of the ground correctly. And if you enable gizmos, then you can see his pathfinding um, algorithm at work. So he's successfully walking around the tree. So let's next fix our animation. Selecting our player sprite, we have an animator component that's been added for us by the character wizard. We'll need to create and assign a new controller. So in my My2D game subfolder, I'll right click and choose create animator controller, and I'll call this um, player controller. I'll reselect the player sprite and drag that into the animator's controller field. If I double click it, I can bring up the animator window, which is where all of the animations that he can play are going to be stored. Now we have the animations inside Adventure Creator, 2D Demo, Animations, and then Brain. And I can select them all and drag them into the window here. Now this isn't a tutorial on creating animations on working with Unity's animation window. We can quickly preview these by opening up the animation window. I'll dock it down here. And with my player sprite selected, I can now choose from um, any of these animations that we have here. So let's have a look at what animations we have. We have some idle, some uh, picking up animations, a talk, and walking animations. And you can see these all have an underscore and then capital letters at the end. And these all refer to different directions. So brainwalk underscore dr stands for his walking animation when he's facing down right. Um, L means left, U for up, and so on. And we can have Adventure Creator play these dynamically by just giving it the name of these animations before the underscore. So back to our My New Player and finding his player component, you can see within his standard 2D animations panel, we have text fields for his idle, walk, run, and talk animations. So his idle name, you can see, is Brain Idle. And again, that's the animation without the underscore and any of these letters. His walk is going to be brain walk. He doesn't have any running animations, but he does have a talk, and that's brain talk. He's able to move in eight directions, so he has multiple directions on, and diagonal sprites, because he can move in diagonal directions. And just for convenience, we can open up this list expected animations field, and it actually shows us all of the animation names that it expects based on the settings here. So the names of these match up 
with what we've loaded into the controller. And now if we run the scene, now we've now got his animations playing. So there are a few things left to do here. The most glaring is that if we walk below the tree like this, he gets hidden underneath it. And that is because his player sprite order and layer is zero, and that's less than the five that the tree has. Now we could set this to say seven, but then that would mean that when he walks here, he would be displayed on top of the tree. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a sorting map. And sorting maps are used to dynamically change a sprite order and layer according to where it is in the scene. We can create sorting maps from the scene manager. And up at the top, we have default sorting map. We don't have one assigned, so I can click create to create and assign one. And if I select it, you can see that it doesn't look like much at the moment, but we want to position this at the topmost point of the nav mesh, the, the highest point in the scene that the player can reach. Then viewing its inspector, I'm going to click on add area twice because we're going to divide the scene into two areas, behind the tree or above it visually and below it. And you see we now get a couple more arrows that we can use to uh, to set the, the divider between these two areas. And we also get these little numbers in between. And these numbers tell us what the sprite's order is going to be changed to. So at the moment it's 1 and 2. Now 1 is fine, but the number here needs to be greater than the tree's sprite. So I'll change it to seven. So now when we run the scene, our player, which incidentally has a follow sorting map component on his sprite, will now change his order and layer between one and seven according to where he is in the scene. But as we move around the scene, um, it's it doesn't really look quite right because he's not scaling as he moves around. He's not getting smaller when he's up here and he's not getting bigger when he's down here. And on a technical level, that's because he's not actually moving um, in the Z direction. He's just moving um, in the X and Y plane. Now we can fix this also using the sorting map because we can use it to resize the player as well. If we check effect character scale, We'll then get fields for a percentage scale modifier for each of these uh, these dividing areas. So his top right up here, um, let's reduce it down to say 90, and the bottom one to say 120. That's 120% of his normal scale. And as I'm doing this, you can actually see um, the, the gizmo is updating the width to represent this change. The middle scale here, we can set automatically by clicking interpolate in between scales. And in fact, to get really accurate values, I can select the player, player sprite, and check edit mode preview so that as I move him around the scene, his scale is changing um, outside of play mode. But when I'm finished, it is important to uncheck edit mode preview again. So you can see when I play now, he is scaling appropriately, and it looks like we actually have a bit of depth to our scene. If we click in a direction opposite to where he's facing, he sort of um, turns as he's walking, which is nicer in 3D, but maybe not appropriate for 2D. So in our player component again, uh, we have a list of movement settings. I'm going to check turn before walking and see how that then feels. I think maybe he's a little bit too slow as well. 
So I'll raise up his walk speed scale to three. And that seems, that seems a bit nicer. Uh, now, whenever we exit play mode, these changes are not saved. So I'll exit play mode and then enter in three again for my walk speed scale. And I'll just apply these changes back to the source prefab. We can make walking around our scene a little bit more interesting by having a camera that is more zoomed in uh, and following the player. In our scene manager, we have a field for our default camera, and it's not currently assigned. And that means that the main camera is just staying still. Now, cameras in AC work by creating uh, game cameras and then using those game cameras as a reference for the main camera. So to get the camera moving, we're not going to be manipulating the main camera directly, but instead we're going to be creating a new game camera. So I'll click Create to create a new default camera, and it's called NavCam1. And if you look through the, the camera preview, you can see we're not actually getting the scene rendering. And that's because it's kind of in the same plane as all the, the set geometry. So I'm going to come out of 2D view and just pull it back like this. Now, the inspector for the game camera 2D has lock options for horizontal and vertical movement. I'm going to uncheck both of these and we can then use the controls that expand to control the way the camera moves. So let's now run the game. And you can see the camera is positioned at the player's feet. And if we walk around the scene, the camera will follow. So let's first of all have it looking at the whole player, not just his feet. And we can do that by going to the vertical movement box and raising the offset to uh, 1.83, this works well. And we could change the, the size if we wanted to, the projection size, but three seems to work all right for that. So we now just need to prevent the camera from going too far off the side of the screen, um, causing it to show behind all of our sprites. And we can do that by checking constrain in each of these panels, and that prevents it from moving beyond the values here. So let's set a maximum value of uh, about 0.88, maybe 0.85 works nicely. And for the reverse, it, this is a mirrored scene, so minus 0.85 is going to work in the opposite direction. Same for going down, if I just move him down to the bottom here. I'll check constrain in the vertical movement, and I'll lower the minimum value to uh, say about minus oops, to about minus 0.6. And it's always easier to make these changes at runtime so we can immediately see the effect they have. But again, when we exit play mode, Unity will forget all of these changes. So I'm going to click on the cog icon and choose Copy Component, stop playing the game, and then paste those component values back in. Now that the camera moves, we can also see that the, uh, the background here is feeling a little bit static because it moves at the same rate as everything else does on screen. If we select the Park Background Sprite, and in the Component menu, we'll choose Adventure Creator, MISC, and then Parallax 2D, we can get a script that basically moves it at a different speed to everything else when the camera is moving. And the first field we get is the depth, and the greater the value, the further away it's going to feel. So let's give it a value of about 0.5, 
Um, generally, you want it between about minus one and positive one. And we'll have it scrolling in both directions. And now when we run the scene, you can see that the uh, it appears to have a depth to it because it's actually moving um, moving as a, as a physical object while the camera does as well. Let's make the scene interactive by giving this tree trunk a hotspot. A hotspot allows us to make an object in our scene interactive by default by hovering over it with the mouse. In the scene manager, underneath our list of scene prefabs, which is a list of objects that we can create, we have a hotspot 2D logic type. And if I click to create a new one, we'll get a new hotspot 2D, which is represented by this yellow square. And I can reposition it and stretch it out to have it cover roughly the tree trunk. Now, this is a, um, a box because it has a box collider, but I could swap it out and replace it with a polygon collider instead if we wanted to uh, really fine tune the shape of this. I'll rename this to tree hotspot. And if we run the scene, when we hover over it with the mouse, we get the name of that game object over the cursor. So I'll enter in a label if not name as tree, and this is in the hotspots component. To make it interactive, we just have to add a new use interaction. We can do that by clicking on the plus icon. And we have a few fields here, but first I'm going to look at player action. And this is what happens before anything else. So at the moment, this is set to do nothing. And I'm going to set it to turn to face. And that means when this interaction is run, before the player does anything else, he's going to face the hotspot. What he then does is determined by this interaction field. And an interaction is a separate scene object. And we can create one by clicking the Create button. And doing so assigns this tree use object, which is also in our scene hierarchy. And if I click on this node icon here, or the one here as well, we bring up the action list editor. And this is a visual scripting window that we can use to script out what happens when this interaction is run. So we're going to do something very simple. We're just going to have the player respond with a bit of dialogue. Our default action is engine wait. And this is just a, um, just a timer. And I'm going to change the action type to dialogue and then play speech. I'll check player line because the player is going to be speaking. Let's say um, I'm too old to go climbing trees. Now to demonstrate how an interaction is triggered, I'm first going to change our interaction method back to context sensitive. If you remember in the new game wizard, we set it to choose interaction, then hotspot. And we can change it at any time in the settings manager underneath interface settings. And here we have interaction method. So I'll temporarily set it back to context sensitive. And that causes the game to be a one button interface. We hover over the tree and we can click and then we get our interaction running. But in this tutorial, we're going to be using the choose interaction then hotspot method. And that involves choosing from a list of verbs what kind of verb we want to use and then clicking on our hotspot. And this mode allows us to emulate things like the old Sierra and LucasArts games where we can choose from a list of verbs and then 
what we want to use them on. Verbs, or our icons, are stored in the cursor manager. And underneath interaction icons, we have a list of three default uh, icons, three default verbs, use, talk to, and look at. Each one has an associated label and texture. And we'll make it so that the active icon is represented by the cursor. So I'm going to check change cursor based on interaction. And we'll also make it so that right clicking the mouse can cycle between each of these. So I'll check cycle interactions with right click. And if we now play the game, and I start right clicking, our cursor cycles in between each of these interaction types. And I can select the use icon to use the tree. But none of the other interaction types work. And that is because our tree hotspot only has a use interaction for the use cursor. So let's make another one. Let's make an examine or a look at interaction. So we'll create a new one and set the cursor icon to look at. I'll create a new interaction, tree look at. And what we'll have is we'll have a short cutscene in which the, the player looks up at the tree, the camera maybe changes for a few moments, and then we cut back to gameplay. But before we start building the interaction, we want to make it so that the player actually walks to somewhere specific so that we have better control over where he is during the cutscene. So this time, we'll set the player action to walk to marker. We then get a message telling us we have to define a marker. And the field it's referencing is this walk to marker field up at the top. So we can create a new one by clicking on create. And if I clicked to select it, we'll find that it is represented by this green arrow here similar to the player start, and we can position it and rotate it to uh, determine where the player is going to walk to and which direction he's going to face. Because if I then go back to the tree hotspot, I can check face after moving. And that means before he does anything else, he's going to walk up to it. So we'll go to the look at icon, He'll then walk up to it and face in this upright direction. So let's make it so that the camera looks up at the tree a little bit more. And we're going to do that by creating a new camera in the scene manager. Again, in our list of prefabs, we have a game camera 2D type. And if I create a new one and rename it to, say, tree cam, and as with the other camera we made, it's placed in the same plane as our set. So I'll just pull it back. Now to configure it, we can either look through the camera preview box here, or if we go to the, uh, the game window and then check the camera component, this then, this camera then becomes active. So let's reduce the size a little bit. Now we're not going to be having it moving, we just want it to be positioned further up. So I'll raise the position like so. Actually, so that we don't clip the top edge, I'll reduce the size a little bit more and set the position to about 1.1. Going back to our tree look at interaction, again, I'll open up the action list editor and this time we're going to use a camera and then switch action. Our new camera is going to be tree cam. And at the moment it will be a snap cut because the transition time is zero. So let's set it to maybe two seconds. And we can then give it a move method, which is basically how it transitions uh, from its previous camera to this one. Smooth is a good default setting. I'll check wait until finish so that the next action we run will not run until this has been completed. 
we can create a new action by dragging out a wire from this bottom socket here. And if I drag and let go into this empty space, it will then create a new action that's connected to our previous. This is going to be, again, an engine wait, but this time let's make use of it. Let's have it wait about half a second. Drag out a new wire to create a new action. And again, we'll have a dialogue play speech. Check play a line. And this time the line text will be, wow, that's a tall tree. And finally, we'll have one more camera switch to take us back to the gameplay camera. And we can either set the new camera to NavCam1 or just check return to last gameplay. We'll leave the transition time as zero so that it's a snap cut. We can use the tree and we can look at the tree as well. Actually, I feel it probably would benefit from a, uh, a transition time there. So I'll, I'll set the transition time to one and make it smooth. And again, check, wait until finish. But we haven't defined a talk interaction. So when we start clicking on it with the talk icon selected, we don't get any response. Now we could go back to the tree hotspot, create another interaction, but we can also create a fallback interaction in case we don't have one defined. In our game editor, choosing again the cursor manager, you'll see that each of these cursor icons have an unhandled interaction field. So let's make one for our talk to icon. I'll click create, and this will create an interaction action list. And this is similar to what we've been working with before, these tree use and look at interactions, except it's an asset file. So if I click it to show it up in the project window, so what I'm going to do is with my 2D game folder selected, I'm going to right click, make a new folder called action lists, and I'll drag this new asset file into there. Now, if I double click on that, it will open up the action list editor for this. And here we're going to create another dialogue play speech, checking player line. And so this will be a generic talk to interaction. So we'll set the line text to, I can't speak to that. So now let's try talking to the tree and we'll get this default response. We can create an opening cutscene for our game within the scene manager underneath scene cutscenes. And here we have a list of um, common cutscene types. If we find the on start field, click on create, and that then creates this on start cutscene. This is just like an interaction. If we click on the node icon, we'll get our action list editor. So in this cutscene, we're going to make it so that the player is first off screen and then walks into view and then faces the camera. We're going to teleport him out of the way as the first thing we do. Our first action will be an object teleport. We'll be teleporting the player and we'll be teleporting to a marker. So the field expects a marker object. And a marker is one of these green arrows, a Player start is also accepted, and we can create more of them at the bottom of the scene manager underneath the navigation panel. So if I click to create a new marker 2D, I'll name this one um, marker 2D off screen. And 
I'll position it. It's hidden behind the camera at the moment. I'll position it around here. And well, actually, its rotation doesn't matter because the player will be off screen. So I'll then assign that as the teleport to. Next, we'll have a character move to point action. We'll be moving the player, so I'll check is player. And we want the player to walk to the default player start, which is also treated as a marker. So we can set the marker to reach as player start 2D. That's our default player start. Now the player is going to be coming from here, which is off the nav mesh. The nav mesh um, covers this area here. So we're not going to be able to pathfind there. So I'm going to uncheck pathfind, but then wait until finish. Finally, we're going to have the player turn to face us. So I'll create a new action, and this one is going to be a character face direction. will be affecting the player, and the direction to face is going to be down. And again, I'll check wait until finish, so that gameplay only begins when he's finished. If we start double clicking around the scene, we find that the player starts moving a lot quicker. And that's because double clicking causes running by default. But our player doesn't have any running animations. That's why he doesn't have a run name field in his player component. So we're going to disable running and we're going to do it when our game begins as opposed to just our scene. So that this takes effect no matter what our opening scene is. In our game editor, at the top of the settings manager, we have a list of cutscene settings. The first of which is this action list on start game field. And if I create one, we'll get this action list on start game. Again, I'll drag it into my action list subfolder. And just like the talk to interaction, I can double click on it to bring up the action list editor. And here we're going to disable running. And we can do that with a player constrain action where we set the walk or run field to always walk. And that just kicks in when our game begins and it prevents us from being able to double click to run. We'll now create an NPC for our player to talk to. We can find some graphics in Adventure Creator, 2D Demo, Graphics, Sprites, and then Bird. And you can see we have two Bird Anim uh, graphic files. If I expand the first one, and actually it doesn't really matter which one we drop in because again, we'll be overriding it with animation but um, I'll drop in bird anims one underscore four. So this bird is going to be our NPC. I'll rename the sprite uh, bird sprite. I should make a quick mention of the fact that all of the bird sprites now have a pivot point at the bottom rather than in the center. And this was a change made in the latest release, uh, version 1.0. 60.3. So if you are using an earlier version, um, you should go through and amend your sprites or just update to the latest release. But the, uh, the pivots are at the bottom because this is best practice when it comes to making 2D characters. So with that said, let's use the character wizard to create an NPC out of this bird sprite. Again, we'll choose Adventure Creator, Editors, and then Character Wizard. Choosing Next, this is going to be an NPC. The character's name, let's call him Jimmy the Bird. And we'll assign the Bird Sprite game object. Again, it's suggesting we'll use Sprites Unity, which is fine. And we'll finish up, and we now have our Jimmy the Bird. 
And if we have a look at him, he's got an NPC component that's quite similar to the players, but he's also got some colliders on him. And I'll drag him to the side here so that we can see it better. And he's got a circle collider 2D at his base on his root object. And he's also got a box collider on his bird sprite. So the bird sprite is where the hotspot is. And so his box collider is the clickable area of that hotspot. It's quite tall because normally it's intended for uh, human characters, but I'll scale it down like so. And then going back to his circle glider, this one is used for player evasion. So basically just to have the player move around him on the nav mesh. I'll reduce the radius maybe 0.4. And then what will happen is the nav mesh will dynamically incorporate this circle collider into it. So it will treat it like another hole, like we did with the tree. Now as for his animations, again we have a list of standard 2D animation names. And we can find his animations in 2D demo, animations, and then bird. And you can see we don't have variants for each direction like we did with the player. We only have one idle, one talk animation. So I'm going to type in an idle name of bird idle. And he doesn't run or walk because he's a bird. But he will have a talk name of bird talk. So he's only ever facing this left direction. So we'll uncheck multiple directions. And you can see if we open up list expected animations, we only have these two clips here. So I'll create a new animator controller that just has those two clips. On his bird sprite, we have this animator component. So I'll create a new animator controller called bird controller, assign that into his animator's controller field, and then double click to open the animator window. I'll drag in the bird animations, bird idle, and bird talk into this window. It doesn't matter which one's the default because Sprite's Unity automatically plays the correct one at the correct time, so we don't need to worry about transitions or anything like that. And we have Jimmy the Bird in our scene, ready to be made interactive. Let's now give our bird a new talk interaction. So clicking on his bird sprite, we'll find the hotspot component and create a new use interaction. We'll be talking to him, so the cursor icon field will set to talk to, and the player action will be walk to marker. And again, we need to define a walk to marker. So I'll click create. And then move my marker so that it's lower left of the bird and angled uh, facing him to the right. I'll create a new interaction by clicking create. And now we have this Jimmy the Bird talk to interaction action list. To begin a conversation, we use the dialogue start conversation action, and the field for this takes a conversation object. We can create conversations in the scene manager. Underneath logic, we have conversation. So I'll create a new one, call this um, bird conversation. And if I view its inspector, I can create some new dialogue options. So we'll make three new options and we can give each one a label. And this is what will display on screen when they appear. So I'll make the first one. Um, Hi bird. The second one. Wow, you talk. Because our bird is going to talk back. And then the third one as, well, 
Bye. Just as with regular hotspot interactions, we can use actions to determine what happens when we click on each of these. We can either create separate action lists for each one, but a better way to do it is to have all of the actions within the same action list. So let's go back to our dialogue start conversation action and assign our bird conversation. We then get an option to override options. And if I check that, we now get output sockets for each of our labels. So we can determine what happens when each of these are clicked on in the same action list. Let's start with our high bird. If I drag out a new wire from that socket, I'll create a new action. Let's make this a dialogue play speech action in which the player says, hi bird. And we'll follow that up with a dialogue play speech again, this time setting the speaker to our bird. So we'll select Jimmy the bird. And he will say, um, hi yourself. We can then make it re-show our conversation options by looping this back onto our dialogue start conversation action. We can collapse actions to tidy things up. Let's work on the wow you talk option. So again, a play speech action for the player. Wow you talk. And we'll have a response from the bird in which he says, and I eat. Got any food on you? And again, we can collapse those and have them loop back onto the action. Finally, we'll have our well by response. And if we don't follow up any actions after this, it'll just end the conversation. So we can walk over to the bird and click on him with the talk interaction. Oh, one thing I forgot. If I go to the um, back to the Jimmy the Bird's bird sprite hotspot, I'll check face after moving so, so that the, uh, the player is actually facing him. So we can choose any of these options. The first two come back to the conversation. And if we choose the third one, the conversation just ends. But seeing as the second option has the player saying, wow, you talk, let's make it so that this second option is only available once the bird has said anything. So we can have this disabled to begin with by selecting it in the conversation component and unchecking is enabled. And then we want to modify our action list for the talk to interaction so that we turn that option back on when we've chosen the first option, this high bird. So I'll move these actions out the way. And after Jimmy the bird says hi yourself, we'll add a dialogue toggle option action. And we also need to supply a conversation. So this is going to be our bird conversation. We can then choose which of these options we're going to affect. Let's choose the second one and we'll set it to on. Then loop this one back onto the start conversation action. And then we'll find we can talk to the bird. We only get two options, but when we've said the first, we get a third as well. Our bird friend is asking us for some food. So let's place down a worm here in our scene that we can pick up and give to him. We can find a worm sprite 
in Adventure Creator, 2D Demo, Graphics, Sprites, and then Worm. And if I expand this uh, Worm graphic, I get Worm 0. So let's drag that into the scene. Place it down here. It's pretty small. Got to zoom in to have a look at it properly. Um, but here it is. And if we make this a hotspot, while the sprite is selected, so we go to the scene manager, click on Hotspot 2D, you can see we have this position over selected mesh option. So if I check that and click on Add New, it automatically uh, creates this hotspot around the worm. Now it is a bit small, so I'll just scale it up a little bit. And I'll rename it to um, Worm Hotspot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this Worm Sprite as a child object of the Worm Hotspot, because when we click on it, we are going to remove it from the scene. And we're going to do that basically by moving it out of the way. So if the Worm Sprite is parented to the Hotspot, it means that's also going to be removed from view as well. In our Worm Hotspot Inspector, we'll create a new Use Interaction. Use is fine for our cursor icon. We'll set the player action, as before, to Walk to Marker, check Face After Moving, and click Create to create a new interaction. We'll define a Walk to Marker, which I'll position uh, above and to the left of the hotspot. And because we'll face after moving, we can set this rotation to the way that the, uh, the player is going to be facing. So down right. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the player play an animation. And if we, uh, if we find the, the player sprite and go to the animation window, dock it down here, you can see in our list of animations, we have among them brain take ground underscore dr, which stands for down right. And if I play that, you see we've got this bending down and picking up animation. Now we want this animation to play in its entirety, but when it's about a third of the way along, about 0.3 seconds, it's at that point that we want the worm hotspot to disappear. So we're actually going to be running two chains of actions at the same time. Going to our Worm Hotspot Use Action List, we'll create an action list run in parallel action. Here we can set the number of outputs, we'll change it to two, and the number that we set here is equal to the number of sockets that we then get. And any actions that we make from these two sockets will then run at the same time. So let's start with the animation. We use a character animate action. We'll be animating the player. So I'll check is player. And once it knows which character we're animating, it then gives us more fields to work with. The method will leave us play custom. And we can then choose the name of the clip that will be played. Now we want to play brain take ground underscore dr. So I'll start typing that in brain take ground. Now I could be specific and type in the underscore dr, but he is already going to be facing to the down right at this time because the marker is facing in that direction as well. So I'll just check add directional suffix, and that underscore dr will be added on automatically. We'll wait until finish, and then return to idle after. In this separate chain, we'll start off with an engine wait of about a third of a second, 0.3 seconds, and it's at this point that we'll hide the hotspot and the sprite from view. So we'll choose an object teleport action. 
we won't be teleporting the player. Instead, we'll be teleporting our worm hotspot. And we'll be teleporting to the marker 2D off screen that we made for the opening cutscene. Let's see how we're doing so far. So we have our worm, actually. Oh. One thing I did forget to do was give our worm a proper name. So in the hotspot component, I'll give him a label of worm. So let's test this. So we can hover over our, our worm and with the use interaction, click on it. And he then bends down and picks it up at the correct time. Let's now add the worm to our inventory. And we can do that with the inventory add or remove action. But of course, we haven't defined any inventory items yet. And we can do that in the inventory manager. So in the AC game editor, we'll choose the inventory tab. And we have tabs for different aspects of inventory. But here we're just going to be creating items. So I'll click on create new item and we can then set the name for it. We'll name this worm. And you can see our inventory add or remove action is now updated to reflect that. So here we're going to be adding the worm. We can give this item a graphic. So our main graphic will set to worm dash icon and now when we pick him up it gets added to the inventory which by default we can access at the top of the screen with the bird in our inventory we can now interact with it and use it on hotspots and other items we can left click on it to cause it to become the active cursor and then use on other objects. We can define what happens when we click on an inventory item within its own properties. We have two standard interactions. We have a use and an examine. The use will run when we left click on it. And if we don't have one defined, then it'll just automatically select it as the cursor. And the examine will run if we right click on it. So let's create a new examine interaction. It's called worm examine. And I'll place it again in my action list folder. Double click on it to open up the action list editor. And I'll give it a dialogue play speech where the player says, you why did I pick this up? Inventory items default to a single click interface. That is, you left click to use it, you right click to examine it. We can have them behave like hotspots if we prefer, so that we can cycle through different types of interactions. By going to the settings manager, and then under inventory settings, changing inventory interactions from single to multiple. And if we then have a look at the inventory manager, we can then create as many interactions as we want, with each one having its own cursor icon, just as we can with hotspots. But I'll set this back to single just to keep things a bit more simple. So let's make it so that when we click on the bird with the worm selected, we give it to him. I'll place Jimmy the bird in our NPCs subfolder and then find his bird sprite object, which is where his hotspot is. And below his use interactions panel, we have an inventory interactions panel. Let's create one. And instead of choosing a cursor icon, we instead choose an inventory item. So we only have one item, so it's coming up as worm. 
Again, I'll set the player action to walk to marker and check face after moving. I'll create a new interaction. This is Jimmy the bird colon worm. And just as with the worm hotspot use action list, we're going to be using an action list run in parallel action so that the player animates at the same time as something else happens. I'll select all of these and then right click choose copy selected and in my Jimmy the Bird worm action list I'll right click and paste those in. Removing the original engine weight and I can auto arrange these to arrange them neatly. So we'll have the character bending down playing brain take ground. Now this time our character is going to be facing upright so we don't want to be adding the directional suffix here because we don't have an upright version of this animation. So I'll just add it in manually so that it always plays downright regardless of which direction we're facing. We don't need this object teleport action so I'll delete that and instead of adding the worm item will be instead removing it. We'll then add a new action, a dialogue play speech, in which Jimmy the bird says, Yum worms, my favourite. So we can pick up the worm, left click on it, and drop it onto our bird here, and the item is taken out of our inventory. If we want, we can, again in our settings manager, enable drag and drop inventory interface. So if I restart this, we can select the worm by holding down the mouse button instead of two distinct clicks. If we drop the worm onto the tree, it's not really going to make much sense. So it doesn't really fit to create a new inventory interaction for this case. So instead, we can create a fallback interaction that will run if no other interaction is defined. We can do this in the inventory manager. We have these global unhandled events and use on hotspot. If I click on create, we'll get this unhandled inventory hotspot, which I'll drag again into my action list subfolder. And so this will run if we don't have any more appropriate an interaction to run. If I double click on this, and make it a dialogue play speech for the player and give it the text I can't use that there. We then pick up the worm and try to drop it onto the tree and we'll get this fallback interaction. If we wanted to make a fallback interaction unique for the worm, we could do that in the worm's properties underneath unhandled interactions. So we now have a bird that we can talk to and he'll ask for food. And we have this worm here that we can pick up and give to him, but he doesn't at the moment recognize that we've done that. So if we keep talking to him, he'll keep on asking us for food. And he's not a greedy bird, so let's change that. We can add logic to our game by using variables. And variables are handled in the variables manager. And there are two types. We have global and local. Global exist in all scenes and can be accessed at any time during the game. Local variables are unique to the scene in which you make them and they can only be accessed in that scene. 
So it's generally a good idea to make local unless you need to access them in other scenes, just to uh, make things a bit more manageable. So let's create a new local variable and looking at its properties, let's give it the name um, have fed bird. The type is going to be boolean. We can choose from a list of several variable types, but let's leave it as boolean. And its initial value is false because when we start the game, we have not fed the bird. Let's have this value change when we've done so. With the Jimmy the Bird worm action list, let's add a new action and make it a variable set. We'll set the source to local because we'll be affecting a local variable. We'll be changing the value of the have fed bird and we'll set its new value to true. And we can test that by picking up the worm and dragging the worm onto the bird. We have show real time values here in our variables manager, and you can see the local variable has now been set to true. So let's update the bird's talk to action list so that he gives a different response based on this value. So we'll go to Jimmy the bird talk to, and he asks for food in this second dialogue option, this wow you talk, which is this pair of actions. So if I just expand these, and he says, and I eat, got any food on you. So let's insert a new action in between these two. And this is going to be a variable check action. The source is going to be local. And we'll be checking if the have fed bird variable is true. If it's not, we haven't given him the food yet. So we want the if condition is not met chain of actions to then run. If the condition is met, that means that the Boolean value is true and we have given him some food. So let's have this redirect to a new dialogue play speech for Jimmy the Bird in which he says, and I'm full, thanks. We can have this also loop back to our dialogue start conversation action by changing the after running field to skip and then the action to skip to, to dialogue start conversation. So we drop the word on him, the have fed bird changes to true. And if we then talk to him, he'll recognize that we've done that. We've got quite a lot of dialogue in our game. So let's make the subtitles menu look a bit nicer. At the moment, we've got the default uh, subtitles menu, because that's what we chose in our new game wizard. But we can edit our entire interface from the menu manager, which we can also access in the AC game editor, and then clicking the menu tab. We then have a list of all of the menus that make up our interface, and speech is played in the subtitles menu. When we click on a menu, we get a list of its properties as well as a list of all the elements that are inside it. This menu is drawn with Adventure Creator. That's the source field at the top. And we can rely on Unity UI if we prefer. But this is a good option for rapid prototyping 
because we can preview everything directly when the game window is open. So first of all, let's have a look at what we have. We have two elements here. We have the label that shows the speaking character, and we have a label that shows the dialogue text. We're going to make the words appear above the character, so we don't need to say the name of it. So in our list of elements, we have subs speaker label, which is this. And I'm going to click on the cog beside it and press delete. If I then click on this subs line label element and have a look at its properties, we can see the label type is set to dialog line. And the appear type for the menu itself is set to when speech plays. So these two things together make it a subtitles menu. The size of the menu is set to manual. Let's change it to automatic so that it stretches with the element inside it. And we'll change the position type from manual to above speaking character. And when we do that, we get this icon in the center of the screen. And we just use this as a reference. So if you imagine the character's head is around here, we can lower the Y value to move it up. And so this will then appear above the character's head. With the subline label element selected, now let's go and change the, the background texture. So at the moment, if I select it, we've got this gray texture selected. I'll get rid of it by choosing none. It makes it difficult to see the text, so I'll then change the text effect to outline. And you can see it's left leaning, so I'm going to set the text alignment to middle center. And for a real retro feel, let's remove any fading, so we'll set the transition type to none. We also find that the, well, the text goes a bit too quickly, and it's also scrolling. So let's get rid of those things. In the speech manager, up at the top, we have subtitles. I'll uncheck scroll speech text, and I'll set a minimum display time of maybe two seconds instead. It also looks like the text is being cut off slightly, so I'll go back to the subtitles menu and just increase the size of the element a little bit. I'll just change the font, increase the text size a little bit, and see how that looks. Let's also make it so that different characters speak with different colors. In our subsline label element, we have an option to use character text color. So if I check that and then go to any of our characters, at the bottom of their inspectors, we have a speech text color. Let's make our players light blue. Let's now enable saving and loading for our game. First thing we need to do is add our scene to the build settings. So I've saved the scene I've been working in, and I'm going to go to File, Build Settings, and then Add Open Scenes to add this to the build. When it comes to saving and loading, Adventure Creator will save only what it knows that it has to. For example, it knows that it has to save the player and what the player is carrying in the inventory. So if I pause the game and go to save, save a new game, then pick up the worm so he's in our inventory and then save again. 
I can load back to the original save and we don't have the worm in our inventory. The player's standing back where he was, but notice that our hotspot and worm sprite are no longer there. And that's because we didn't tell the scene that they had to be saved. And all this is, is a case of flagging up what parts of a scene we need saving and in what way. Now, when we pick up the worm, the worm hotspot is removed from view. We, we move it to this marker here. So we want to save this object's position or its transform. And we can do that by adding in our add component menu, we'll choose adventure creator, save system. And then from this list, remember transform. And that will tell the save system to remember its position, its rotation and its scale. But when we have many objects in our scene and we have different types of data that we want to save, it's quite tedious to go through our scene and attach the appropriate remember component. So instead, we can go to our AC game editor, choose the settings manager, and at the top, underneath save game settings, we'll click auto add save components to game objects. Um, it will tell us that this is a non-reversible process, so we should save the project and the scene. But when we've done that, it then goes through all of the objects in our scene and attaches the appropriate component. So let's now try again. We'll save the game as soon as we begin. Pick up the worm. I'll save again and I can load between these two saves and the worm hotspot and the sprite is correctly restored. As a final touch to our game, let's give our player a shadow. We can find a shadow sprite in our My2D game graphics, sprites, and then brain folder. Let's drag in brain shadow into the scene. I'll position it about here and then attach it as a child to the player sprite. Now the follow sorting map will affect our children, but we need to make sure that the sprite is always placed underneath the main player sprite. So we're going to do that by checking offset original order. And that means that whatever the order in layer is when we start the game, that will be added on to the sorting map values. So let's set the player sprite default order in layer to zero and the brain shadow sprite to minus one. And that will mean that it's always one less than whatever the player sprite is. So I'll click apply. And you can see that the player sprite changes between one and seven as we move around the scene and the brain shadow goes between six and zero. So that about wraps it up for this tutorial. Um, like I said, it's not really much different from the old 2D tutorial, um, but if you are looking for something more advanced and or you want to be working in 3D, have a look at the new Unity Adventure tutorial. All of the tutorials can be found up at the top by choosing Adventure Creator, online resources, and then tutorials. Thanks for watching.